My name is Eleanor Bard, and I'm um, a work psychologist. And I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about how I came to write the book and also share some practical tips with you um, from the book to give you some ideas so you can take away something practical from the session. So while I was writing the book, um, I had cleared a month in my diary to finish the first draft. And I was geared up, I was ready to go um, when I had this agonizing pain in my abdomen. And after um, a relatively short period of time, my partner and I decided that perhaps I should go to the hospital. I was admitted as an emergency. And after what felt like a million tests, um, I had emergency surgery. Um, it turned out that a, um, and forgive me for the TMI here, uh, six centimeters by four centimeters cyst had leaked infection through my whole abdomen. Um, and that was causing this really agonizing pain that I'd been feeling. Um, they removed my cyst um, and as a surprise bonus, one of my ovaries, and I spent 10 days in hospital, uh, had an antibiotic drip, um, eventually it cleared up uh, the remains of the infection until finally I was able to go home. Uh, clearly two weeks of uh, book writing time had passed and I wasn't feeling great. I wasn't feeling super um, pumped and excited to be writing my uh, book about self-care at work. And the irony of the situation was not lost on my friends and my family and my partner. Um, and I really had to draw on a lot of the techniques um, in the book to get myself back into a place where I could connect to the work and to the joy of writing, which is um, a pleasure for me to, um, to, to really get ready to produce the book again. And it took me a bit of time, but I got there. Um, and happily, um, I think I was able to um, get the book written. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, how I did that. Um, but this interest that I have in workplace matters and self-care goes back a long way. So as um, Hugh and Carl said at the beginning, um, I'm a chartered psychologist, a chartered workplace psychologist. Um, I have uh, just over 20 years experience. I think I've worked in about 25 countries now, and I've worked with um, clients, uh, participants from more than 50 countries, um, which is a, such a joy, such a privilege. I've worked with some of the biggest organizations in the world, private sector, public sector, from um, accountants to prison guards, uh, from entry level positions to CEOs, uh, such a range of wonderful people that I've met in the world of work, uh, doing assessment, development, coaching and training. But that's only half the puzzle. The other half is uh, I have two chronic health conditions, or I had two chronic health conditions, now I guess I have three. Um, Driving to run my very first training course um, more than 20 years ago, I was sideswiped by a lorry on the M6. I remember it very well on a snowy day. Um, and that uh, accident, which was super serious at the time, gave me a chronic pain condition, uh, which lasts until this day. And 10 years after that, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, um, which is a condition that causes uh, inflammation of your digestive tract. <clears throat> so those two health conditions had already caused um, quite a lot of change in my life. Uh, I had experienced those two conditions while I was working six hour weeks in a consultancy, a job that I really enjoyed, but it took a big toll um, on me. And eventually my, my, my life had narrowed down to work and pain. <clears throat> and I, although I loved that work, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't a full life that I was living and I could see that. So I made some big changes um, about eight, nine years ago, something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my life changes were I took a sabbatical, a three month sabbatical originally, but I never went back to the world of work in the UK, because um, that's where I was at the time. I traveled, I ended up in Thailand, um, and I reinvented my life. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry. 
Um, I reinvented my life after this sabbatical in, in Thailand um, to become an independent consultant and author. And so those were some really big life changes that I made. Um, <clears throat> and in the day to day, I also made a lot of changes. Um, as a psychologist, I had a lot of tools that I could draw on to bring um, more nourishment into my life, more joy, to think about the kind of person that I was and the kind of person that I wanted to be. And I drew on a range of those tools at that time, um, everything from journaling, gratitude practice, um, recognizing the small pleasures in my life day to day, uh, taking a lot more rest. I, I was an independent consultant, so I didn't work uh, full time. Uh, taking at first gentle exercise, this is me um, a little bit later on after I'd um, been doing the exercise and the yoga a bit longer. And really thinking about values. So what was important to me and how could I create a life that um, I was able to live in alignment with those values? I also uh, started a blog um, around self-care, um, productivity, being able to be um, a productive person and still take care of yourself. So balancing those two needs that I have. And I wrote a book about self-care. So I was sharing my experience and my ideas. Um, and that was something that I enjoyed very much. Um, and I had started really creating this, this different life for myself, very different from my life in London. Um, however, it didn't take that long, a few years maybe, um, before I had a bit of a relapse. Um, Soon this um, really joyous life, I mean, again, it was super exciting where uh, I was traveling and working with people all over the world, um, changed into something that was taking, again, another toll on me. So when I went to Thailand, um, I'd intended to lie on a beach, read a book most of the time, um, and freelance part time. <coughs> Sorry. But it didn't take long before that adventure of working in lots of different countries. Um, and I think here you can see, let me see where those photos are, Malaysia, Dubai, uh, Hong Kong, China, Vietnam, I think there, maybe. Um, that uh, adventure of working in all those different countries uh, ended up in me doing 100 flights a, a year. And that was not quite the life that I'd meant to end up in either. Um, I had learned to run my own website um, because for the uh, blog, the self-care and productivity blog, I wanted to be able to do it myself. I wanted to understand how it worked. I wanted to be able to make changes. So I also learned how to um, make websites. I was writing a travel blog because, you know, clearly, why not? Lots of um, different countries I was visiting. And, um, I also, because writing was a real passion or is a real passion, uh, started writing fiction. So I put out three novels and I had a website for them too. So I had three websites, quite a lot of books going on. Um, and then six years ago, I met my um, amazing partner and his then four-year-old son. And that was an entirely new adventure for me to um, absorb into my life. So a lot was happening. And what I realized is that you take your personality with you wherever you go, there you are. Um, it's really true. And it was this realization yet again, and I think it's a realization that I suspect um, I'm gonna have many times in my life. I don't think this is gonna be uh, the last, that um, self-care is not something that you tick off a list. Uh, it's not something that's done self-care, taking care of ourselves, our wellness, our health, uh, in all the different parts of who we are is something that is an ongoing thing. It's a habit, it's a practice, it's not something you tick off a list. And the wake up call this time was uh, getting uh, bacterial tonsillitis or strep throat uh, seven times in one year. Um, and that was the, the piece that really said to me, okay, you need to really go back to your uh, self-care practice and um, get on top of it again oh and then uh, COVID hit 
And uh, I think we can all agree that drawing on our self-care and our um, health wellness practices are pretty critical uh, during this time. And at the same time, uh, the clients that I was working with, um, because that, that piece continues, uh, were telling me how exhausted they were. The demands of this new way of working, of hybrid working, whether people were working at home, whether they were uh, doing hybrid working sometimes in their in office, whether they were um, frontline workers who were having to deal with people um, in situations that were far, far different than they'd ever really expected, meant that people were really hungry for support, for help with um, being able to nourish and nurture themselves in the workplace, uh, just to keep up with the demands of the world that they were living in. So um, not only myself, but the people that I was working with also were really looking for tools uh, to be their best selves at work. And so uh, the book was born. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, what work wellness means to me, because it's a hard, a hard thing to define. And to some degree, uh, it's self-care at work. Like that's a way that you can talk about it. But I think it's a bit more than that as well. But I'm going to start with the self-care piece. So for me, uh, self-care is about taking responsibility, taking accountability for our own uh, mental, emotional and physical health. So that accountability, responsibility piece is really important. Um, but in the workplace, we don't just have ourselves, we also have the people that we work with. So we have um, the social, the relational aspects of our workplace. And even if we're a freelancer, even if we're an independent, um, there are still gonna be people we're working with. Uh, freelancers have customers, they have suppliers. Um, and nurturing ourselves in the domain of other people is also really important to this idea of work wellness. And then the last piece that I um, tend to kind of bring in here as well to work wellness is our environment. Um, so this, I can tell you, was one of the coldest um, offices I've worked in. So I was interviewing, uh, assessing someone in this room um, uh, some country somewhere uh, and it was a rather big room uh, for myself and my poor um, person I was working with and it really says to me this idea of well what kind of environment are you in and does it bring you does it nurture what you want your workplace to be because that um, office space um, whether it's uh, a coffee table um, in a coffee shop, whether you're at your kitchen table, whether you're in an office of 30 other people and it's an open plan office, all of these places bring with them uh, different facets which are gonna influence how we are in the workplace. The other piece that I think is really important to acknowledge in work wellness is this idea that when we can't take um, action and responsibility for everything. So some things in the workplace, we can't do anything about. I mean, COVID clearly would be one of those things. Um, that's a situation that I don't think any of us plan for. Um, but there are also aspects of our workplace like um, uh, redundancies or um, big change or um, even an office move is a great example that they're out of our control they're not things that we can do anything about or we can take responsibility for or for our own actions our own behaviors how we act in the world um, and so recognizing that there are some aspects of the workplace that are outside of our control and here you see my um my road in um, Thailand, in Bangkok, uh, during the Bangkok rainy season. And you can see, um, sadly, we do not have control over rainy season here. Um, it becomes quite uh, intense when it's rainy season. Um, but it's a good example of sometimes things are outside our control. And we're going to be a lot happier um, in ourselves if we understand that there are some things we can do things about and there are some things we can't. 
So the book is designed to be quite practical. So for me as a psychologist, one of the things that I want to make sure the people that I work with have, uh, whether I'm doing that um, face to face, in person, or I'm doing it through a book, is really practical, useful tools um, that are grounded in research, that are grounded in um, the kind of things that actually work. Uh, that they can take away with and do something with. And the design of the book is quite short ideas um, where you can write within the book itself. And the toolkit, um, as uh, Hugh, I think, said in the very nice introduction, has 100 different ideas in. So it has 10 different chapters, uh, so 10 different areas, and it covers some of the topics that come up most often with people in terms of taking care of themselves at work. So whether that is about um, time management, whether it's about the physical environment, as we were talking about, whether it's about the relationships that we have with the people that we work with, whether it's about doing the tough stuff, um, all of these there are ideas on. And it's designed um, not so that 100 ideas will all be relevant to every person, but much more so that you can pick what is relevant to you at any particular time. Because for me, some of the principles uh, that I base the book on are, first of all, and I th hope I've got this idea across already, our experience at work and who we are in work and what we do at work impacts the way that we think, feel, uh, and take action outside work. So how we um, are, how the kind of day that we have, um, you know, we're, we're gonna take that day home for most of us. It's, it's hard to have really um, hard boundaries between work and our personal lives. And this is even more so the case now when the, um, the electronic age means that we can be contacted at any time, you know, in any place. Um, and we can receive our work email when we're out at the theatre with a friend or um, when we're just having reading a book in the bath because we're reading it on our um, phone. So that's the first principle that uh, our work and our home or personal lives affect each other. And so taking care of ourselves at work is just as important as taking care of ourselves at home. And so you can and should take care of yourself at work just as you do at home. But how we do that is unique to each one of us. So there's no um, like perfect list that someone can give you, which is your prescription for work wellness. Rather, we need to um, understand some of the options and decide based on who we are and what's important to us. And that might be what's important to us now, or it might be what's important to us in terms of our personality or in terms of the kind of work that we're doing at that time. There's lots of different things that influence that. And what's important to us now might be different in five years time, how we take care of ourselves now, what we need now might be different um, from it was five years ago. And there are many, many ways that we can approach it. And so the design of the book is to give you a real breadth of ideas that you can draw from to do that. Now, um, what I'm gonna do uh, for the, the second part of the, um, the talky bit here is to take you through three of the, um, uh, the ideas in the book. Um, so the first one is from the physical environment chapter. And here you see a page from the book. Um, I thought that it would be nice to uh, give you a taste of what the inside of the book looks like, because I think um, one of the things my publishers did was a great job with the design. Uh, as I said, I think earlier on, it's designed to be something that you can fill in um, either the book itself or you can have a notebook, but there are um, spaces to give you room to express yourself in the book if you want to. So this first idea that I want you to um, have a think about is called Sea Beauty. 
And it's relatively simple. So for my, from my experience, and I visited a lot of offices, a lot of different workplaces, um, offices can be very creative with lots of um, inspiring surroundings, um, or they can be very bland, more functional, um, and also designed to the um, to the the norm. So to design not to offend anyone, I guess. Uh, so that nobody is um, jolted out of their uh, particular um, being able to be productive in that environment. And that means that sometimes we have to customize the space a bit to bring in from the outside um, some items of beauty or joy or something that brings up a particular emotion in us to give us that bigger picture um, and I have two uh, particular items on my desk, which are underneath my um, underneath my monitor that I'm going to show you. So um, the first is a shell. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, so this shell is something that my uh, partner brought me back from a holiday he was on um, with his son that I wasn't on because uh, I was working. And it's something that, um, first of all, I find it very beautiful in terms of the, how smooth it is, um, the design of the shell, if we say that, the, the patterning on the shell, I find it really beautiful. Um, and it also, as it happens, brings up some very um, positive associations, clearly, um, in me. And so, it brings in some of that outside world. Uh, so when I'm writing a report or um, dealing with a um, more challenging um, client, um, having a tougher conversation, it reminds me that there's more to, to my life than that particular interaction at that moment. The other thing um, is a, a very tiny, I'm not sure if you can see that quite as well, um, but a very tiny um, hedgehog. And this was my dad's, and he uh, very sadly passed away uh, about 15 years ago. And this is something which is, uh, I find super cute and, and um, beautiful in itself, um, but it also reminds me of him. So what you can see in both of those objects is that they're very personal to me. And remember that sea beauty here it's not about other people, this being some kind of objective standard of beauty. This is about the object being beautiful to you, meaningful and beautiful to you. Because the idea is that it um, takes you um, out of the moment, out of a, um, a difficult moment and reminds you that there's joy and beauty in the world. So I'm gonna give you um, a minute or two to think for yourself, um, about what object, what small beautiful object you might have. So if you want to, you can think about the three questions or you can, if you, something came to mind for you immediately, then, um, then that's fine too. And just type it into the chat, I'll um, open the chat so that I can see uh, what people um, come up with. You don't have to obviously type into the chat, but if you want to type in um, anything that comes to mind for you. Um, I like mine, I'll give you some more um, thoughts. I like mine because they're portable. So as you can tell by my 100 flights a year, uh, whilst right now I, I haven't actually been anywhere for over a year because of COVID, more than actually, um, I was traveling so much that my whole office was put it in a, be able to put it in a briefcase and take it with me or a rucksack and take it with me. And so having these two items, which um, I could take with me, um, also meant that I could put them on a coffee shop or in a hotel room usually. Um, now let me open up the chat. So, so take just a minute or so. And let's see. Um, it might be a cowrie shell. I, I, I'm not very... Um, I just know it's a beautiful shell, but you can... Probably people who are more um, 
better with the natural world than I am would know what it is. I, I think of it as a shell, a beautiful shell. Um, okay, so what do we have? Polished rock from a memorable hike. Yep, lovely. Um, so that gives you both the object of beauty and something meaningful, which is lovely. Uh, postcards of Paris and Rome, definitely. In fact, one of the other ideas in the book, not to give too many ideas away, but um, is to think about something that you can think about the future. And so sometimes I suggest to people that they have um, a postcard of somewhere they want to go or um, a coin or a stamp from somewhere that they want to visit um, to give them that kind of reminder. Um, okay, and um, a beautiful uh, wooden bowl. That's very lovely. So feel free to keep putting ideas in there and I'm gonna go on to the next one. The next. So on this one, first of all, I'm not gonna ask you to type any answers in. So that just relieves you from that pressure. You can just be thinking about this one for you at home because it's a bit more of, um, there's a bit more depth to this idea in terms of the thinking you have to do. It's more internal thinking. So one of the, big challenges that we face um, in the work world um, and our personal lives, but particularly in the work world, is the pace of change that we face. Um, in the consultancy that I um, started at, we used to have a phrase, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, change is a constant. Um, and in consultancies, for some reason, they love changing things. There's always um, something different happening, someone coming in to make their mark on the consultancy and do things differently. So this idea of having more tools to handle change is another way that we can look after ourselves in the workplace. And so there are two um, questions that you can ask to help you reframe. So it's a relatively simple concept, this idea of reframing, looking at the situation from a different perspective. So typically when change happens, we often um, more or less so a bit depending on our personality, but also just as humans, we often look at what might go wrong in this situation? What might the challenges be? What might the problems be? Um, what do I need to watch out for? And so reframing is about trying to look at the situation in different ways. Um, so for me, um, I disclose that I am not a natural, um, I'm, I guess I'm adventurous in that I um, live in a different country uh, and have changed my life, but I don't see myself as very change orientated. Um, and I used to find change very challenging. Um, after. Uh, both being put through and being making some choices uh, around quite big life changes, I think I'm a lot more comfortable with it. And I would also say that working with so many different uh, nationalities and cultures has also helped with that. But I still have to make some effort. And these two questions are really useful in terms of handling change. Um, so the two questions are, first of all, how else could you interpret this situation? So in this situation, maybe your initial thought is, oh, panic, what's gonna happen here? Um, it's all gonna go wrong. I like the way it was, why do we have to change? Um, and so the, the first question is, how else could I interpret this situation? So what other frame, whatever lens could I look at this situation through? And then the second question is, what might be the opportunities here? So rather than just looking for the problems, what might be the opportunities that the change might bring you? So to again, give you a bit of an example, um, in my first job, well, in my first job as a work psychologist rather, because I'd had quite a few jobs before then, um, as one does when one's younger, but in my first job, after I'd done my postgraduate work, I um, had a job as a graduate consultant. And um, I really thought I was on the path to success as a graduate uh, work psychologist. Um, however, 
after one year, I was made redundant, um, which is not ideal, not really what you're looking for. And it was a really tough time. And at that time, those different experiences gave me a lot. So um, now, obviously, with the hindsight of the future, I was able to, I'm able to see when I was do in that situation, what it brought me was different opportunities in terms of being able to take the experience I'd gained in that one year and um, branch out and gain different types of experiences so that I was able to then get a more senior role at a different consultancy um, in a relatively short period of time. And so that's been one of those life lessons that's taught me to think about what might this new situation, whatever it is, bring me in terms of opportunities. Um, and when I made the decision to take a sabbatical, because even taking a sabbatical for three months um, when I did that was quite a tough decision because it meant stepping away from a job I loved. I thought about what might be the opportunities, um, how could I interpret this situation in a different way? And when I think about the situation where I was made redundant, um, I can think about at the time I had this, um, these thoughts around, you know, I'm not good enough, um, I failed, um, I, I wasn't, uh, they don't want me. Um, but actually I could have reframed it um, as I know now, because I know a lot more about the situation and what happened to the market was really difficult. They lost a really big, they were a small consultancy. They lost a really big client and uh, they made half the consultancy team redundant, um, all of whom were much more senior than I was. Uh, and I was unlucky. Um, and so that reframe helped me in the future to think about, okay, so when I'm facing this, um, you know, really difficult situation, because this is not to say that there aren't still challenges with these changing situations that we go through, but it can help us to think in a realistic way, what is the opportunity here and how else can I think about this situation? How else can I um, interpret this situation? So I wanna give you um, a couple of minutes just to have a think about this. I'm not gonna ask you to um, read these out. This is just for you to think about. So, but I want you to take, um, take a minute or so just to think of a particular situation that was tough for you or that maybe is tough for you at the moment, something that's going on for you and think what other lens could you put on that situation and what might be an opportunity in that situation for you? And these are good examples of um, the kind of exercises in the book so you can get a feel for um, what it might bring you. So um, it can be a relatively small situation. So redundancy is obviously quite a big one, um, but maybe it's that you uh, have to move desks. Um, this one is a small thing, but can often feel very threatening to people because usually if you are in an office, um, then you have people or, or if you don't work in an office, maybe you're in a branch and you have to move branches. So move location in some way. And usually we have our network of friends around us, either the people we know um, or um, if we work in a particular branch, uh, then maybe we know the people we work with, we know our route, we know the sandwich shops around us and so on. And so a question would be, okay, what is the opportunity in this situation? Um, and maybe the opportunities are to meet new people. 
Um, so you're going to be, it gives you a great excuse to uh, justifiably connect with other people in the business and maybe make new friends in the business who you can add to the people that you already know. So that's um, an example of an opportunity. Um, and in terms of interpreting a situation, okay, so um, perhaps you are given a task and your man, you give, you hand your task in, let's say it's um, um, a report or something like that. Uh, some piece of written, something written that you've had to give to your boss and your boss doesn't reply. Um, and in your head, you're thinking, well, I must have done a terrible job. They um, think I'm a, a terrible, whatever your particular um, uh, work is. Um, I'm probably going to be fired. And we have a tendency to, you know, go to a more of a worrying um, state. Whereas actually, if you think, well, how else can I interpret this situation? Well, perhaps your boss is busy. Um, perhaps they have um, some personal issues at home. Uh, perhaps they um, have got their own challenges to deal with coming from their boss. Um, and there's lots of different ways that the situation can be. And maybe you'll find out one day what it was, what maybe you won't. Um, but that's a good example of how you can uh, just, tr just even that expanding uh, creatively and thinking about a different way about interpreting that situation can be helpful. All right, I am gonna go on to the last um, activity now, um, which is again, a shorter one. Um, and one where you can um, put your ideas in the chat again, should you have any, should you want to share. So this is from the mindset chapter and mindset here is around our assumptions, our beliefs, our values, the things that shape our way of thinking and the mindset that we have can really make or break um, a day. And there are lots of ways you can nourish yourself here. Um, and some of the activities in the book go quite deep about um, who we feel that we are in the workplace, what's important to us at work, why we work, what our core beliefs are. Um, but I'm, I'm going for a shorter one uh, to give you a, a way of going back to your workplace, whatever that might be, uh, to notice the good around you and to create more uh, positivity in your day. Um, so again, as, as we talked a bit about in um, the change example, we are hardwired for survival, which means we're, we have a tendency to notice the potentially negative more than the potentially positive, because that um, in our evolution is going to have had more of an impact on our survival. Um, and that means that we can be biased towards the negative. Um, even in our modern world where there is no um, uh, predator chasing us, where we're actually an apex predator ourselves. And research from the Gottman Institute tells us that we need usually around three to five positive interactions uh, with someone to balance out a negative interaction. And so if you have a day where you have three or four negative interactions, you're going to need more positive interactions just to feel on an even keel. So not to feel positive, but just to balance yourself out. And so one way to um, do that is to actively seek out and create opportunities for positive interactions in your day. And this can be very small and has the benefit of not only influencing your own day, but also the days of the people around you. Um, so examples here could be as small as uh, smiling at other people. So uh, smiling at people when you see them in the morning, for example, uh, asking people how their weekend was or how their evening was, um, or slightly more involved activities could be um, sending someone a message to say congratulations on a, a new role or a new job or, or something that they've done, an achievement. Um, it could be um, saying thank you, um, saying thank you for something that someone's done for you. Again, it could be quite small. 
uh, for giving you, for helping you with something. Um, it could be showing an interest in someone else's work. Oh, I hear you are working on this particular project um, or you dress the window um, for the Christmas season. Um, I heard you got really good feedback on that and I thought it looked amazing. So there's lots of different ways to create those positive interactions. So just take a minute now, no longer, um, and see if there's one positive interaction that you can include in the next um, work day you have. So whether that's tomorrow or um, Saturday, depending on what kind of job you're in, um, share one small positive interaction that you can include in your day. Um, so getting a colleague a coffee, yep, definitely. That's um, very helpful. I assume or offering them a drink, just in case they don't. They're a crazy person that doesn't like coffee. I think that um, really uh, shows my own predilection and need for coffee there. Um, all right. So yeah. So if you take away one thing from the um, session, then it's that you can and you should take care of yourself um, at work, just as you do take care of yourself um, at home. Our experience inside work affects us outside work and vice versa. Um, I, I also believe it's important for you to bring your best self to work in order to be your best self at work. Um, so those two have interactions on each other and we're all unique. So you need to understand yourself and understand what is going to nourish you as an individual in the workplace. So that is the last of the um, pieces that I wanted to share. So come find me. I am um, at ellenbard.com. That's my website. And you can find me on Instagram, Ellen Bard. You can find me on Facebook at Ellen Bard Wellbeing and Twitter at Ellen Bard. I'm on all of those. And I'm looking forward to hearing some of your questions now. Um, so one thing I would say is that I think therapy is still a useful and important um, piece of our self-care. And sometimes we need to get outside help. So that is a kind of caveat uh, on top of this. Um, one and the other side of that, so that's at one and the other side is I think that it is very helpful to us to be proactive about our work wellness, um, almost like taking a vitamin, I guess, and trying to keep yourself nourished uh, day to day, because that will help when things are stressful, you'll have some kind of um, support already there you'll have something to draw on you won't be empty when those stressful times come so those are kind of two pieces around that I think when stress um, is starting to become a real problem is things like is it um, there all the time so do you feel that way constantly um, you know all of us get stressed over a particularly tough day um, or a tough project um, and that's normal, I think. Um, but when that stress level is consistent and they're all the time, then I think that's not a very healthy environment or situation. And, and we need to take more proactive ways to handle that. Um, other things to look out for are if you're tired all the time, if you are irritable all the time, so you're snappy, you don't have the same... Um, patience or or kindness you, you don't have much to give to the people around you because you're using it all up on just handling your own difficult situation so those would be some of the things that I might be looking out for um, along that continuum bearing in mind that there's also something called uh, eustress which is the positive stress that we feel so eustress is this idea that actually a little bit of stress 
can be helpful for us in some situations. So if we're doing something particularly important, a little bit of stress can give us a bit of energy, excitement, nerves to um, get us through. So there are 10 chapters, as I said, and you could do the book from beginning to end, um, or you can flick the book up, you can flick the book open and just look at something that calls to you, something that speaks to you. Um, I don't think that forcing yourself to do any particular exercise is especially helpful. Uh, I would say, um, and this is the, the psychologist part of me coming out, if you feel real resistance to a particular exercise, you might want to just think about why. Um, maybe it's not an exercise for now, but it's maybe something to come back to later if there's some, something going on for you um, with that particular exercise. Um, but I would say, um, Picking an exercise that speaks to you is probably going to be the most beneficial, particularly when you're starting. Like, the point is not to make something like work wellness another horrible thing to tick off your list every day. It's to make it uh, something that nourishes you, something that you enjoy, something that maybe sometimes is a bit tough. Like it might be, um, it might be a little bit hard at times because sometimes in order to nourish ourselves, like going to the dentist, that's a form of self-care. Um, going to the dentist is something that in the moment is maybe a bit tougher, but we know that in the long term, it's going to take care of um, our physical body. In the same way, thinking about some of these more difficult issues might in the moment be a bit challenging, but in the longer term uh, is going to bring you a lot of benefits. So the answer is you don't have to do them in order, but you can if you want to. Um, you can skip chapters entirely if they don't speak to you right now. Uh, you can do a few exercises, put it down, come back to it, do a few more. Uh, really, the book is designed to work for you, whatever that means to you, because we're all so different. So I actually like one of the reasons that the um, uh, beauty exercise is in there is because I, I really like it. Um, I included, uh, and I think this is really a staple, uh, taking a deep breath, because it is such a simple thing. And yet for so many of us, we go around every day um, breathing so shallowly and just taking a moment to take a really deep breath from your abdomen and letting it out really slowly can just give you a few seconds respite from whatever stress you're facing um, in order to handle that. Um, the other activity that's really uh, important to me, dear to me, is uh, the, those around finding your values, so understanding what is important to you and using those to make decisions by. So those would be a couple of my um, of the exercises that uh, particularly speak to me, but all of them are things that um, I've tried or uh, worked with with clients or experimented with um, and have done a lot of research around. Yes, I think that the concept of work wellness couldn't have even been a thing um, when we were a society where we were um, had an agricultural um, economy um, and our lives were very different. And actually rest was much more baked in. Uh, because we were more seasonal, um, the way our lives was, um, you know, we had to harvest during the harvest. Um, life was very differently run uh, then. And there are countries, and Thailand is, is interestingly one, where that is still very much the case. So um, whilst Bangkok has a population of something like 12 million, it's a mega city, so it's a big population, there are another... 60 or so million Thais who 
live in the country and uh, rice farming is a hugely um, important part of the economy and that is very seasonal. And what that means is a lot of people in Bangkok go home for certain seasons to help their families with the rice harvest. Um, and so, so jobs here are um, seen slightly differently and there's a lot more fluidity in the labor market because of that. Um, so in terms of Western culture, um, I think that we've been through a lot of phases and the industrial revolution um, really put such strong boundaries around work. Suddenly we had, um, you had a need to have everyone start at the same time because factories were running 24 hours a day. Whereas before that, it didn't matter if, um, you know, someone started a bit earlier or later in the fields. Um, but you really needed that for the factories to run in the most profitable manner. So then you've got, as you say, um, the, the advent of technology, which changes our interactions with work again. And that has the pace of change, I think, has been one of the biggest uh, things that we've been facing there in terms of something that people have to manage. Um, and obviously the pandemic has been this in, incredible uh, pace of change where the entire world of work uh, almost within a month had to change. Um, so, you know, I was doing a hundred flights a year and then it took my industry a while to adjust. Um, and now I'm able to do a lot of my work online and my clients are very comfortable with that. Um, but that wouldn't have happened had it not been for um the pandemic um which is a strange thought now burnout was identified before the pandemic um and what it says is that certainly in industrialized nations you've got this issue that people's time um is really blurry so we have because of um the uh, electronic um age which i guess is, is where we are this idea of you can be contacted at any time in any place the expectations around uh work life boundaries are very different and that's creating a lot of stress stress and pressure for people um, and seems to be contributing to burnout and thus you have this um slow pushback in terms of this isn't so healthy for us, what can we do about it? How can we put boundaries in? And some of that comes to, okay, well, how can I be more productive with my time? What can I do with my time to, to make use it better? But there's always more tasks. There's always more to do. And so taking care of ourselves, nurturing ourselves, which for example, might include saying no to some things is equally important. Um, so it's a big question I've, I've uh, gone off on several different tangents. Um, work is different in different countries, absolutely. Uh, and, and that comes from lots of different things. So time is a really big one. So in the Middle East, where I work uh, quite a lot, uh, the sense of being somewhere at a particular time at exactly is a lot more fluid. People uh, it's a lot harder to get people to meetings on time. And often when Westerners go to the Middle East, they find that a really tough culture shock, whereas um, the culture there is very relational and relationships are really important in the workplace. Um, in another um, uh, culture that I was talking to recently, they told me how they were really shocked at how some of the, um, I think they were talking about Australians, were able to um, have a big argument in the workplace and then go out for a beer afterwards or go out for a drink afterwards. They just couldn't understand it. For them, if there wasn't a sense of harmony in the workplace, there was no way that they could be friends with that person outside the workplace. So there are a lot of um, perhaps more differences in work than we realize um, and that's one of the um, things going to lots of different places has given me um, and so that's another reason for finding the things that work best for you um, yeah
So uh, it's a real problem for people uh, and it comes up time and time again. How do I um, not have this leakage between work and home life? Uh, and our boundaries are, are, as I say, really porous around this. And so some ways to help that um, include what's called thresholding, which is which can be as simple or complicated as you make it. But essentially, it's saying that um, we create either a physical or a mental threshold where we transition from one space to another. So you can do it um, verbally by saying, I am now at work. I have now finished work. That's a type of threshold, a verbal threshold, uh, where you then close things down. And what you've done is told yourself, okay, I've, I've created that space between work and um, my home life. Now, if you do that over time, that habit builds up and it, and it really helps you to let go because you've created this, this space. You can also, um, so one of the things people really had used um, thresholding for, used to, to do thresholding and perhaps didn't realize it, it was commuting. So what was happening is people would do their um, 45 minute commute into London or wherever they were going. And that thresholding would be a type of, that commuting would be a type of thresholding. And so um, one thing I suggest to clients and to, um, to coaching uh, people I work with is to walk around the block or to just walk around uh, the garden or um, just to go to the shop and buy a paper or just, do some kind of five minute walk, which acts as another type of threshold exercise so that you can say to yourself, okay, so this walk was the threshold between um, going to work and um, uh, coming home or and vice versa. So that's some ideas on thresholding. great question so burnout um one of the reasons that one of the aspects of work wellness for me is about remembering what you can and can't control is that burnout is a condition that is not caused by your actions that the surrounding situation uh, contributes to burnout um, so the, the situation that you're in, the pressure that you're under, the things that are being asked of you are not something that is sustainable over the long term. And it's really important to know that about burnout because burnout is a term that is used in a relatively casual way at, at times. Um, and this, the condition of burnout that the World Health Organization is talking about is um, contributed to by this other party. We can impact this. Um, we can take actions to help ourselves if we're heading in that direction, but it doesn't all come from us. So that's one thing. Um, and so this idea that sometimes the, the healthiest, the most well thing for you to do is to leave the situation um, is an important one and one I didn't want to leave out of the book because I think that while it's not an easy thing to do, sometimes for your own health, it might be the right thing to do. Um, and actually, I guess as I reflect on this, um, I'm a good example of that where I was in a situation where I was working for a consultancy and consultancies put very high demands on their um, team members. Um, I was one of the leaders, one of the management team. So I had responsibility for a lot of, um, a lot of things in terms of um, budget, team members, clients, lots of different aspects. So, so those are all coming from the workplace, but then I also was bringing chronic health conditions. So trying to balance those uh, became untenable for me in the end if I wanted to have more of a life than just focusing on health issues and my work, which I did. 
So when do we need to think about leaving? Well, there are some practical uh, pieces to this. So um, I absolutely understand that it's hard to leave a job where you're financially um, secure, where you're financially dependent. And so sometimes it might be about when you are able to have somewhere else to go. Um, so when you have that, and that requires some energy to look for another job, which if you're exhausted is not um, a super easy thing to do. Um, when the demands of the job are consistently more than you can handle, um, and there doesn't seem to be a way out of that situation. So you have talk to your manager, you have spoken to HR, because there are methods within organizations, certainly good organizations, to explore when these situations occur. And so once you've gone through those avenues and you haven't been able to resolve it, then it's probably time for you to think about, well, how do I exit from this situation? Um, which again is a difficult decision for most of us because as we've talked about before, change is scary, um, even when it's good change. Um, but sometimes it might just be the job is wrong for you. Um, it's not adding to your health and well-being, uh, whether that's your emotional health, your mental health, or your physical health. So feel free to come and visit me on the blog. So I um, publish my new uh, small writings there. So different, there's more tips and ideas and suggestions there. Um, and as I say, I also have a book on self-care, which is already out, which people, um, yeah, it's called <laughs> This Is For You. Um, and so that book is about self-care, the other side of self-care um, in your home life and has, another I think that one has 101 ideas in some more practical ideas um this <laughs> the your work wellness toolkit is just out so I have a number of different um ideas on where to focus next but we're not quite at the I'm trying to have some space um between writing the next one and while the um marketing activities are going on but hopefully there'll be um another one coming up but people can find me on ellenbard.com um, and I am Ellen Bard on Instagram, Ellen Bard Wellbeing on Facebook. So personal for people. I've seen individual pages but no one's been brave enough to show me the whole thing which is fair they're designed to be really um, yeah intimate for you to really they touch on some deep things because we bring all of who we are to work. Um, and that's both amazing and challenging. <laughs> <laughs>